To know your suspect minds, this is what we will be talking about. Uh, I just heard the part of this, uh, the last bit of this uh, polygraph uh, uh, presentation, which was great. And um, I think that would give us a lot of good ground also to discuss um, layered voice analysis. But I think that uh, you will find some, uh, some very interesting differences between the two. And I think that while Polygraph really focuses on lie detection. We actually, uh, using voice analysis, we want to go a bit deeper into your suspect's minds. And while the polygraph normally comes at the end of the session, while you know that the person is, you know, you 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 know exactly what you want to ask and what you want to verify. Voice analysis normally comes at the beginning when you need to understand your playground, when you need to collect the evidence, when you need to fine tune your messages. And for that purpose, we will be using voice analysis. Now, voice analysis is, is a very big concept, but I want to, I want to try and, and zoom on it. The purpose of voice analysis is to identify tiny emotional traces that your suspect is trying to hide, okay? It is about how to understand how the, the suspect feel about different parts of the, the story and to so we can identify the weak spots. Unlike what we've just heard about the polygraph, which is a very, very structured conversation where you have irrelevant, relevant, control, sacrifice relevant, sometimes different types of questions that are designed to provoke different reactions, LVA uses a very uh, different approach and we want to have an open discussion. We want to let the person speak or the suspect speak, explain his stories and let him tie his own lies uh, around himself, okay? So the principle about using LVA is not to be such pinpointed as with the polygraph. It is about revealing the whole truth, the, the, to understand the exact underlying truth and on all its complexities and all its uh, um, uniqueness of, of uh, um, combinations. So with that, let's talk a little about the basics of voice analysis, just so we have everything um, together. So th that I'm sure that you all noticed, right, that when you're speaking with others, we are normally picking some nonverbal cues, right? I mean, I can show excitement, I can be uh, so happy to see you guys, and I can be maybe not too sure about what I'm saying, right? And I can be very angry and demand to speak with the boss. And these are all verbal cues that I'm giving for others to listen. Hopefully they will get it so they can have a complete picture about how I feel. But I just want you to think for a second how often you do that to give someone else a false idea about how you feel. Oh, I love your dress, you know, this is such a beautiful dress, and you actually don't feel like it. Well, how nice to meet you, and you actually think, why didn't I go to the other side of the street? So these are all things that go inside the, the, the field of voice analysis. And actually, it comes up with a bit more. Voice analysis is a general term for actually three very distinctive disciplines, and we must know how to separate them completely. One is understand what the person is. There is this, this field called voice print. Voice print deals with the unique characteristics of everybody's voice. And so we can say, okay, now you're speaking with Amir. Now you're speaking with someone else, maybe. Nemesis technology has nothing to do with it. We don't care about who is speaking. We don't care about if it's male or female. We don't care about anything that is of any type of identification feature. Second thing in voice analysis is obviously speech to text, maybe the most common one, understanding the textual messages that are being delivered. And with that, uh, Nemesisco also has nothing to do. We don't care about the language. We don't care about the dialect. We don't care about the choice of words. We don't care about any of those. The third field of, of, of voice analysis is actually emotion detection, or as it's called today, EDR, emotion detection recognition. And this is actually where things get interesting because as I've just displayed before, we actually have two sets of emotions, right? There is the one I'm trying to display out, 
using my acted voice or using my uh, acting abilities. And there is the one set which is what I'm feeling inside. So this is quite an interesting the differentiation. The typical classical way of analyzing voice is done through the science of phonetics, which is normally relates to the vocal phenomena that we can hear. They are longer, they have more amplitude, and these are normally going after the pronounced and, and loud vocal parameters. If we use those to assess emotions, we can probably get a very good sense about how people act, their feelings. LVA technology is very different in that sense, because while normally phonetics deals with 20 milliseconds and above, LVA deals with 20 milliseconds and below. And what we do is we collect a lot of biomarkers that are present in these very short time frames, very short time frames and very low amplitude that we cannot hear ourselves with our ears. If we could, we could regulate them. But this is the principle of LVA, to deal with the things we cannot pick up with our ears, so we cannot regulate them. And we actually use these leftovers or these traces of, uh, that were left in the voice from the genuine emotion, um, with the genuine emotion that were arising through different topics, so we can reveal the true sensation and, and feelings even though they are suppressed in our tone of voice. You know, maybe I'm having a negotiation, a business negotiation, and someone says, you know, I'm going to give you a million dollars for that. And I, you know, I only wanted, you know, half a million dollars. So now I'm very excited, right? I'm very happy about this offer, but I don't want the other person to know I'm happy. So instead of going, oh, really? That's great. I'm going to go, no, you know what? Let me think about it. So these are the differences between phonetics and LVA with the pronounced and unpronounced elements of the voice. And so obviously I, I never met anybody in the investigation room that sits and said, yeah, you know, no, I never lied to anyone. It doesn't go like that. It only goes like that in, in little movies or cartoons. And so we had to develop this uh, much deeper technology compared to phonetics. Just to sum up, okay, LVA doesn't care about your language or your choice of words or who is speaking or what is their act. All we care about using LVA is how people try to suppress their emotions and how to get the genuine and true emotions. I'm sure you noticed, by the way, that I didn't say once, understand their lies, okay? Because I think LVA gives us a much broader um, view about how a person feels, which eventually, yes, will lead to revealing the truth, but will give us so much more than that. And will actually, that would be the part of the discussion maybe later. Just to sum up about LVA, LVA technology is a set of patented vocal parameters, which are exposed in the patents. Many, many different secret parameters that we've decided not to expose in patents and methods of calculating the baselines and scale of emotions, which in a way substitutes the, um, the need of control questions in our activities, because in a very similar way to the way the polygraph acts, we also like to understand the homeostasis of the person. What is your natural state where you are feeling comfortable? Emotional homeostasis is a bit more complicated because there are different people, you know, there are people who are more emotional, there are people who are more logical, but, or people that are more stressed. But in essence, this whole concept of detecting the homeostasis and jumping out of homeostasis is the same for polygraph as well as for uh, LVA. Well, LVA baseline is a bit more complicated because of the emotional ingredients. We do have a mixture of LVA that deals with psychology and criminology and psychophysiology and phonetics and, of course, the nervous system and brain sciences. So these are all put together and Cisco employed over the years, many, many experts in these fields. I'm personally not an expert in none, but um, I was able somehow to fuse this uh, or to lead the, the fusion of all these sciences. So in essence, just like I mentioned about the polygraph, it, the LVA technology is about examining the connection between 
my experience as a criminal or potential criminal and my psychological uh, experience concerning that and the relationship that comes to my mind as I realize what's about to happen. Lying is always about what is going to happen. I don't like what is going to happen if I'll tell the truth, so I have to decide about an alternative path. We have to remember this fact because this moment in time when you decide to make the lie is very, very important. Okay? Once I realize the consequences, this is where my body reacts. This is how I will let my mind affect my body and create a reaction that is picked up both by voice or by others. Okay, so again, how this all affects, there is a generation of speech. The speech is um, generated by these multiple activities from the brain and moving a lot of muscles. The deceptive circuit is that point in time when I decide to make a lie. And this is really like a switch. You know, you can say, okay, I'm telling the truth or I need to, I need to lie. And that moment of where I turn this switch on, actually makes my brain work in a very different way. Now it's not just about spilling out information, it is about creating an alternative story. And this creation of alternative story involves many, many different other elements in my, in, in my brain. I need to remember what I said. I need to think about what you may know. I need to make the connections between all this. Suddenly this is becoming a very heavy duty mission. And so that deceptive circuit involvement would start interfering with my emotional reactions, which will in time affect, the moder and, affect and moderate my expression and my uh, speech. Now, this is actually another very interesting difference between uh, all systems that deal with psychophysiological uh, reactions and uh, detecting uh, uh, psychological reactions in the voice. When you're dealing with a system that deals with psychophysiological reactions, you need a close contact. You need to touch the person. You know, when you sit with a polygraph, you need to hook in uh, to these uh, GSRs and you have to, to measure the uh, uh, lung capacity and, and all these other measurements, which are not really available remotely. And then what we measure from the body is just the FOF. That's the reaction for the fight or flight syndrome, which is really from body perspective, very much the same. I need to prepare the body for action. I need to pump more blood. I need to suppress my pain and I need to be prepared for an action. Maybe it's running away, but maybe it's fighting. In the voice, because voice is a much, much uh, more flexible medium and it's available, I could actually be running a test or you can be running a test on me right now using this very medium. Uh, we can collect voice from any source. We can collect voice from past recordings. But the most interesting thing about the voice is that it separates the emotions. I mean, if stress, excitement, confusion, they all look the same from body perspective, from the voice perspective, they look very, very different. That was one of the very first things we've identified and that was quite a shock because quite frankly, as, as uh, uh, the introduction about me said, we were looking to build a lie detector, not separating these emotions, but this was just uh, uh, something that we had to deal with. And um, we then learned a lot about the benefits of, of doing so, because again, when you're doing, um, when you're measuring body reactions, you present a stimulus, right? You present this uh, uh, control question or relevant question, and you need to wait. Technically, you need to wait 30 seconds between one question and the other just to let the body go back to homeostasis. Well, the reactions in the brain are very, very spontaneous. They are very quick. And it's actually just the moment I realize there is a problem, it would immediately affect my voice. And so, that's, that's uh, um, something that has to be considered when you are trying to compare the different methods and uh, um, serving the same, the same goal. There is a lot of benefits for using the polygraph. Polygraph uh, um, test or any psychophysiological test is very intimate. 
people touch uh, people uh, because of the touch because of the, the proximity people feel much more in the game and it's very difficult for them to escape it um, they feel you can control a lot the environment so this is something that you guys cannot obviously do when you're if you'll be analyzing me right now because you don't know what's happening behind that door and maybe there's a lot of noise maybe something is attracting my attention and of course there is another very big benefit for using psychophysiological reactions which is really the constant nature of those and sometimes you can use equipment that deals with psychophysiological measurements even in a silent test it's sometimes enough for you to present a stimulus maybe the knife used for a specific crime and my body will immediately respond to that okay in the voice i obviously have to have collaboration and the person i'm investigating must be speaking as we mentioned before there are these basic three sensations which i think is very important to understand again from body perspective they will all just create a rise but in the voice they look very very different and stress for example that's the body reaction to a threat we have to understand it comes with expectations of pain, suffer, and punishment. And so once we identify a stressful event, amygdala identifies a stressful event, it sends back an alert to the, cere to, to the cerebellum, which will then take control. That would affect speak generation. It will actually create some pauses. It will create some type of disturbances. The, uh, um, the cerebellum is very good in preserving us. So going into survival mode and making sure that the body survives, it's very bad in speaking. So it cannot really speak. And this is the way, this is why when we are in an acute state of stress, we cannot really speak. But this is from psychological point of view, the way that I wanna run away, that's the flight syndrome excitement or aggression would be the opposite i'm actually looking at something which i want to engage and now i want to move forward to that specific target and normally with the expectation of um sorry maybe with the sorry normally with the expectations of joy and excitement and some something positive to happen while i engage okay so from body perspective it's all the same from mind perspective uh, perception that's a completely opposite reaction and then comes the cognitive stress which was the first one we actually identified in the voice which is really the conflict and i now face a situation i'm not familiar with there are two or more parallel uh, processes running in my mind one says run away one says engage one says you know go find another solution which i don't really have and this is affecting the voice again in a very unique way which we then call subject not sure or cognitive stress or depending on the type of uh, of need There are also more profound emotions that LVA can pick up, such as excitement, concentration, embarrassment, sorry, embarrassment, um, arousal, anticipation, intensive thinking, how much I'm, I'm trying to invent something, how much I'm trying to imagine something or recall something, and also how much I'm hesitant about what I'm saying or happy to say or speak freely or consider very carefully my words. These are all critical indications when you conduct investigation, because if I know how my suspect feels, what he's hesitant about, when he's being Im uh, imaginative, when he's being aroused, when he's being excited or nervous, I can know immediately what path to follow and what is my next action. There are also the classical emotions. These are not included in the LVA 650 detections such as happiness, sadness, anger. This comes with a very intensive logical process. I know that normal classic, uh, classifications in, in psychology defines them as basic. Our research showed that they are very complicated to perceive and we could not refer to them as basic. Basic is excitement, stress, uh, confusion, which in a way kind of infuse the happiness, sadness and anger uh, detection at the end 
These are included in the next generation of the technology, which is the LVA7. So just um, to sum up with the, the classical emotional theories of LVA, LVA was not designed to follow any classical theory. LVA classifications uh, are sometimes even very different than what is known in the classical approaches. But the thing about LVA, all the theory was built from the ground up based on identified patterns from actual field studies in real life tests. Sometimes yes, sometimes in controlled experiments such as troop tests to identify the cognitive stress. But normally we collected indications only from real life settings all over the world. So we know that these are the same for all mankind, wherever you are, may you live in India or Japan or Mexico or Israel or Russia, we are all just the same. But before we go deeper, I do have to make some things uh, noted. You know, when you're using voice analysis, voice analysis by nature is very sensitive. And if there is a lot of noise, and if there is a bad quality of the equipment, and maybe there are some compression that I use, or maybe there will be a white bunny jumping around me that would create some irrelevant stimulus, you know, during my discussion, that would of course affect my psychology or my uh, input into the system and obviously affect the results. So we have to remember all these things. And while we still take all these limitations in mind, one must still remember that um, we can still get so much data out of these uh, um, voice segments, almost in any type of uh, quality. But of course, common sense must be used. And that's, that's I guess, a, a common rule for everybody practicing in our um, activities. We, almost must, we always must use common sense with every decision we make about other people's lives. Going just to the very basics of uh, foundation of good and bad, which is really what causes stress and excitement. I know we've been through that with the polygraph uh, uh, discussion before. Do you ever lie? Yes, no, of course, we all lie. We all lie to the people that we like. We all lie a lot. We lie to serve different purposes. And we learn to lie from a very young age as a part of a mechanism that is an action reaction type of studies. Sometimes it starts with you as a kid trying to get a candy. And then you go to your father and you say, father, may I have a candy? And your father says, no, you can't. And you say, but mommy said I can't because last time you did that. Last time mommy said you can't have a candy, you got a candy. So you remember the chain of events. Now mommy is not around. That's not, a, that's not a part of the story, but I remember what happened when I said mommy can. And then mommy's not around and father would then tell the kid, you know, mommy's not around. How can you say that that, that uh, um, she, she allowed it? Are you lying to me? And then you start making the connection between lying is bad and I wanna be good. But there's a dilemma, right? How do I get what I want and still keeping good? There is a contradiction here. And this contradiction is what drives all these different reactions. Now, lying is, as I mentioned before, always about foreseeing and altering the future, right? I, there is a desired outcome. I cannot get it saying the truth. So I need to create an alternative path, which may be compromising the truth. And then um, I have to think about how to overcome my fear of punishment. And I have to suppress my desire to be good while I'm trying to do uh, what I need to do, right? If I'm successful doing that, I would always try more and more, and that's the addictive nature of lying, which uh, I'm sure we all know from different parts of our life, people that this is just their sport. We define six different types of lies, um, actually, and if you think about this, these are all driven by the different motivations. First of all, this is the most common one, the defensive lie. I would lie to protect myself from getting hurt. This one is obviously driven from the stress feeling and I want to dis dis distance myself 
from a situation. I don't want to get hurt. I would like to preserve myself. Then there is the offensive lie. The offensive lie is when I lie in order to gain something extra. This is something that you would do with your insurance, for example. And you would say, no, I don't know. I, I just ran into this uh, situation and somebody hit it. And yes, I had my laptop and my computer and everything that was in the car. I just want to get compensation for this, which I don't deserve. I'm not going to be punished. I just want to gain something extra. This comes from a very different motivation and from a different, completely different set of uh, um, expectations and uh, emotional reactions. Obviously, there is also the white lie, which I would like to protect someone else. The motivation is very different. There is no stress, there is no gain, but there is a lot of conflict, right? Embarrassment lies, I'm sure everybody can think about several uh, lies of, of that nature, which we would like just to protect ourselves from getting embarrassed. It doesn't mean a lot, okay? But I don't want you to know what I've done last night, okay? Or I don't know, I don't want you to know where I've been um, this last month, okay? So these are just a different type of maybe smaller lies, right? But it's still providing false information. Most common type of lie, however, is the convenience, right? Convenience lies is something that, again, is, is very mild. It's nothing, you know, not important. Well, when did you came to work? Well, I've been there, you know, 15 minutes ago. I actually just got in, you know, just right now, but I want you to believe that it was 15 minutes ago. Where are you now? I'm five minutes from the office, okay? You, you're not five minutes from the office, but you just say that because explaining the truth is very complicated. So. I just like to make it, you know, a small lie to keep it aside and to leave it. Jokes, however, are also a very different type of lie, right? Jokes normally tell a situation that is not true, but with the entire purpose of entertaining. And it doesn't carry any punishment. It doesn't carry any type of other emotions other than expectations to be entertaining. Should we consider jokes lies at all? I don't know, that's um, a discussion to be made. The deceptive circuit, if you remember, we talked about it briefly. Deceptive circuit is the moment in time where I decide to make a lie, but just think about it in terms of the emotional mixture at that point, right? There is a stress of uh, dealing with the consequences. There is excitement because you want to be over it. And there is a conflict because you know what you're doing is not maybe not the right path forward. So when we have this mixture of emotions, which normally come one or the other, then, um, then we know something extreme is happening in the body. This is the, the complex sensation uh, state. The deceptive circuit is defined as the moment where we realize that the future must be altered. We must apply a, a set of thoughts uh, about the desired outcome, and we must suppress our fear and attempt to charge forward at the same time. So this is the decision actually to change the course of things to come, if you will. Now, there is a question to you, and I would like some answers if you don't mind, you know, can you be telling the truth and lying at the same time? Can anyone give an answer to that? Let's say that I used to play basketball when I was 14. Okay, I was playing in this uh, team of basketball players. I was wearing the shirt, it says Maccabi or whatever the name was of the team. And I was playing basketball. Can I say I was professionally playing basketball? Well, these are, these are experiences from the past. And the fact that I was wearing a shirt, in my mind, I was playing professional basketball when I was back then. I'm still used to say that, okay? So I don't have any intention to lie. I was playing professional basketball when I was 14, but obviously deep inside, I know that I wasn't playing professional basketball. I never got paid for it. I was a professional dancer when I was six. You know, I wasn't a professional dancer when I was six because I never got paid for it. But again, in my mind, I'm not lying. I'm telling something that is maybe 
in a deeper way, um, my deeper uh, self-awareness is creating this type of reaction. It happens much more than you think. So in LBA, we actually do monitor these different sets of um, self-control or self-awareness, and we create these um, indications about what we call deep lies. It may be something that is exciting and confusing, and then in a much deeper level, you understand that you are not telling the truth. LVA will reflect that. These are normally coming from a very uh, unique concept, which we identify as the moral level or the embedded sincerity. And the moral level is something that is also very critical in our science of understanding the human nature and human lying mechanism, so to say. And the level of morality, when we are facing a criminal, or when we are facing a person, we don't really know, okay? So we need to deal with an unknown moral indication or, or moral status. We need to walk sometimes and quite often as police investigators with people with very low moral values. And we need to analyze sometimes psychopaths, which would look completely normal, but obviously have zero uh, uh, understanding of um, social responsibilities and, and therefore the moral level is very, very low. And this is just so we can understand distribution of um, moral levels in society. We've got the truth fanatics, which are people that are terrified of saying anything that is not 100% truthful, and they will try to do whatever they can to say the exact and complete truth. On the other side, we have the psychopaths, which couldn't care less about telling a lie or, or, or your, your impression of them. And normally we've got, um, it's pretty standard Gauss table, uh, Gauss uh, distribution of, um, of people, moral levels. Most of the people have something that, that would consider to be, they, they know when they do something that is wrong. Where this affects us, when we are measuring reactions or when we are looking for deceptive reaction, we have to take moral level into account. And the higher my moral level is, the lower the stimulus needs to be to create a high reaction. But normally, the lower my moral level goes, there is more and more that I would be willing to accept as a person, and I would still consider those to be truthful. You know, sometimes when you, in, in different places, you know, when they say, you know, I've been 15 minutes late and I was actually an hour and a half minute, uh, uh, an hour and a half late, that would still be okay in my mind. In some places where I, you know, missing one minute, I already feel that I was completely late. So these are the different perceptions. And so my reaction is always in, in consideration with the jeopardy with the intent to deceive and on my moral scale. Is that clear? Because this is very important. Now we will go to the investigation settings, which is also very important. And I've heard some of these um, discussions also with the polygraph thing. So this is um, something that is easy to understand. Um, as I mentioned, lying is all about motivation, right? And the way we try to influence, um, the, try, the way we try to influence the listener to, um, to believe our fake stories, right? And so there are a lot of settings that are around us that can increase or decrease the reaction. For example, Actually, there are nine elements that uh, we, we calculate. And we have to remember that reaction to a lie is not an on-off switch. Actually, it is a scale and we need to control it. The more elements we control in that situation, the more we can affect the positive outcome of the test. <clears throat> First and foremost is understanding the conversation type. It 
if we're having an open discussion where I don't know where I'm going to be uh, talking about, is one thing. If I know I'm hiding a secret from my uh, chat partner, that's a different thing. And if I'm going into an investigation, that's of course a very different one. When having an open discussion, I don't know in advance what would be the discussion topic. If you ask me a question that I would need to cheat about, okay, or lie about, my responses will be very sharp, spontaneous, and will probably fade immediately after as the discussion moves on, unless of course I'm suspected in giving a wrong answer. When I'm speaking with someone I know I have, I've done something wrong to him, okay, and I just don't know if this discussion is about that or not, then that reaction may come, you know, may, that memory may come and affect my discussion patterns um, in a random order. Okay, now we're talking about something and suddenly there is this uh, concern. Maybe he knows, maybe that's the next question. Maybe he's trying to trap me. So then reactions would come and often we see that in LBA is something that we just cannot explain. You know, why is this person reacting here when there is no reason for that? And then we can answer, okay, maybe there's some, some guilt knowledge here. Let's try to understand it. And then you start asking questions to identify if there is a reason for the guilt knowledge. Normally this happens in a, in a work-related environment or in a, um, some more intimate relationships. Of the third type is the structured conversation. That's a classical uh, investigation. When I go into the investigation room, I know exactly what I'm being going to be questioned about. I know exactly if I'm going to lie and what questions. I am preparing some stories, and very similar to the very similarly to the polygraph um, situation, we need to shake the person out of their comfort zone. Nevertheless, we will be doing a swipe test, right? We will be doing a structured investigation. We want to understand reasons, we want to understand the background, we want to understand relationship, we want to understand the possible motivations. And so during this type of conversation, we would want to go over and identify the pre-planned lies, the, the pre-planned lies, identify them and ask questions surrounding them, which were typically not planned. Another thing is um, in, in the entire set of, of investigation is always the power of expectations. And this is known as the Pygmalion effect on one hand, the Galatea effect on the other. If I let my suspect feels, feel that I expect him to lie, if I expect him to lie, if he expects himself to lie, then obviously there is some very low reaction because again, lying is not something that is forbidden. I just gave you permission to lie. I just said, no, I know you're going to lie to me, so I'm going to lie to you. And that's going to cause a very low reaction in my body. But if I'm telling you, listen, I want to give you a fair chance to be honest, to come clean. I know that you want to come clean. I, want, I know that you want to tell me the truth. Tell me what happened. That contradiction increases in some degree in most of the people, not in all of the people, in some people, the degree of reaction and the sensitivity because I'm expected to tell the truth. I hate, I know, I can't, but, but this is the way it's happening. The other thing, of course, is the relationship with the, the suspect and the, the contract that is the nonverbal agreement between suspect and investigator. And if I am letting you feel that you are superior to me as a suspect, if I'm letting you feel that you own that session, if I'm letting you feel that I fear you, then obviously the reaction would go again much, much uh, weaker. If I'm letting you know that I will not tolerate it, and you are here to tell me the truth, and you are here to be, uh, uh, to follow my lead and my instructions, as I must admit that the charisma of uh, the polygraph expert was just amazing in that sense. He was leading the conversation with a very strong charisma, which is paramount to creating this environment in the uh, investigation room. If you fail to create it, you will get poor results. 
something also to keep in mind. The room setting itself also have a lot of info, a lot of uh, importance, and we must always make sure that the room is clean, that we have no um, no uh, uh, external stimulus that may affect us. We always opt to have two investigators in the room, so one can always observe the body language and can always look at you, and the one can always look at the LVA and kind of give indications. Keep good light, make sure that there is no echo. Somehow people feel more comfortable lying when the light is off, they feel that they are less red. When using LVA, of course, that's going without saying. Uh, we have to avoid noisy environment. We have to keep the, the environment quiet. And uh, sometimes, you know, people sit with the pen and they do the clicks and they do uh, the noises. And of course, this is disturbing LVA analysis and we like to avoid that. Try to keep the room casual. I mean, any strange appearing things, anything that can attract my attention to the as uh, out of the situation would of course make um, make my reaction fade or allow me to control better my reactions have other people around the room if they are not relevant to the conversation if they are not relevant to the investigation prefer to have them out if they are not a part of your stimulus have them out some people will feel closer or more intimate to speak with you and more uh, uh, bounded because of this contract that you've created and other people in the room will just affect that results and you don't want that. And of course, biofeedback. Sometimes biofeedback is great if I'll just do, and this is a trick we normally do in investigation rooms, when we identify that there is something that is wrong in the set, uh, we'll just say, you know, we have a blue here. Why blue? Because that's not red, it's not green. And I know I just lied. So I know I lied, he said blue, maybe that was a coincidence. And then I lie again, and I've got a blue again. Then I know, then I know you're actually inside my head. You know exactly when I'm not being truthful. And that's the power of biofeedback. But if I watch the screen, if I watch my own analysis, as I speak continuously, that would immediately distract my attention to focus on these results. And it would take a long time just to overcome this biofeedback um, for me to allow me to regulate my emotions. Other critical elements, which is something that um, we've researched in Hungary with the, with the government university and um, is affecting a lot of honesty tests. These are two things that must always be taken into account when you do lie detection tests with uh, people. And one is the unrelated secret. Maybe I'm gay. Maybe I, I don't know, I've got this fetish thing that I just can't have you know. Okay, not that I'm saying anything of that is bad, but just for the sake of this discussion, I have this personal secret I'm keeping and I don't want anybody to know about it. And whenever I hear questions, I'm hearing, are you gay? Are you, and, and I'm always reacting to my internal voice and not to the external one. And then you see reactions that are all over the place with no sense to what's whatsoever. And we cannot really take the test into account, but we do know that there is some unrelated secret or some very deep secret. We need to calm you down. We need to explain that whatever you are fearing, we don't care about. We care only about this topic. We care only about this step. I don't care about your personal life. I don't care about any of your personal secrets. This is what I care about, okay? And then try the test again. The second thing is when we are talking with vegetative responders and they are sitting in the investigation room, willing to surrender. And if you are willing to surrender, then you are beyond the fight. You will not be reacting to anything and you may actually come up as green, as a complete NDI. And you will be answering questions just for the protocol, but you're already willing to surrender. And in that case, we know we have the techniques to make that confession, that confession materialize. 
but when we see a flat line, it doesn't mean that the subject is honest. It means that he is vegetative. And we must keep that in mind as well. LVA 650 system running on a computer connected to a microphone or a set of um, um, connectors through the internet or through a phone system actually comes with two modes of operation. One is the real-time mode, allowing me to run investigation during, um, to, to run analysis during investigation, get indications on the screen in plain text and understand what is my critical path and what question should I ask further. Then I can take the recording, put them in an offline process, which is much more advanced, much more intensive, and much more rich in, in details and fine details, actually. And let me come up to my own conclusions once I have the time. Now I can compare different sections. Now I can go back and forth. Now I can say, oh, we mentioned father three times, and three times we've got extreme stress. What does that mean? Oh, here he's talking about the, the person looking at his belly, and we suddenly see arousal. Why is that created? You know, what type of indication can that lead? And where can we now look for an evidence? Just for the sake of understanding, online mode is what we call using the short cycle of LVA. It's only using 101 primitive parameters. It generates five basic indicators and deals with five emotional states. Offline, on the other hand, adds additional set of primitive parameters, and then it goes up to 14 basic indicators and 11 emotional states, which are very quickly uh, separated and classified. We talked about the homeostasis. Homeostasis is about understanding what is my natural set. And so there is a calibration both in the online mode and the offline mode, which is a bit different because in online mode, I need to understand your homeostasis so I can now analyze in prediction for the future, right? We need to provide indications as soon as possible. So the calibration is quick, short, at the beginning of the session, about 15 seconds, and it will tune as the conversation develops to compensate elevating stress or reduction of, of uh, excitement or whatever. In offline, it's very different because I already have all the set of data. I can screen back and forth the entire set of data and make a baseline that is based on the most common elements or the most common emotional reactions that I get from the entire set and find differences along the way while doing so. LVA screen looks like this. This is the real-time display. It can identify excitement. It can identify uh, uncertainties. The, the principle itself is to get the, the voice stream. We cut it into fragments of between 0 0.3 and up to two seconds. A voice segment is a logical block of voice. So if I say yes, that would be a 0 0.3 seconds, but that's a logical point. If I say, yes, I did, then that's obviously longer, but that's still the same segment. There was no break and that's still a logical part. So every indication coming from LVA will be about that logical block of continuous uh, speech. Um, the analysis process itself will extract the vocal parameters, compare them to the baseline, and come up with both graphs and the textual summary, which is the highest level of detection that the system picked up at that point. These indications can come up as truth, as, as uh, stress, as excitement, subject not sure, voice manipulation, inaccuracy, and high risk, which stands for extreme deviation from the baseline, normally indicative of a line. In LVA, actually, uh, but this is something that has to be said about the textual messages. Textual messages are, of course, just a summation. So between 130% deviation to 189% deviation from the emotional stress baseline, we will call that excitement. Above 190, that would be called high excitement. So obviously, when you're 189, that's borderline. So we have to always remember the limitation of using text analysis and use it only as a way to simplify the analysis and to capture a lot of information quickly. When we're talking about the risk analysis or so-called lie detection, 
Risk analysis is done in LVA using three different independent formulas. One is calculating my um, risk stress, which is really the deviation from, um, from the baseline in multiple parameters, not just one, never just one. Sometimes you know, stress is just stress. So even if I'm extremely stressed and the system will say extreme stress, if there is no excitement ingredient in that, if there is no cognitive conflict ingredient in that, it will stay stress. But if there are a mixture of emotions, then we would call it in a different name and maybe that would even become high risk or something around that. But the risk, um, the risk stress is in fact a subjective measurement that takes into account my emotional reactions comparing to my, homeos, uh, to, to my homeostasis. This is why we call it the subjective risk. Lie probability is actually a statistical formula taking all these emotional variables, comparing them to the known set of the entire public that we've collected over the years. And this is comparing my emotional state to what we know to be deceptive situations in other situations. And we calculate the statistical risk. It can come from five to 95 to make sure that people always remember that there is a room for mistake. Always come with a modest approach and there is a room for mistake. The third, uh, the third uh, uh, mechanism of, of identifying lies is actually the deceptive pattern matching. We know that some emotional states correlate with higher significance or higher statistical uh, occurrence of lies. We have the, the offensive lies or the defensive lies. We talked about them before. LVA also have a mechanism of comparing emotional statuses with the known deceptive patterns so we can identify exact type of lies. So which is more useful? Subjective analysis, subjective analysis. Um, we don't know, okay? So our mission is always to provide information to the decision maker, the investigator, and so we can make the most informed decision in the context and might make sure what is more relevant in that situation. <clears throat> As you know, we talk about LVA is dealing with the voice. So um, there is another concept that I would like to introduce, which we call the emotional intensity. Emotional intensity is the moment I realize I'm getting excited, okay? I may get excited, you know, very shallowly and for a very brief moment in time, or I can get highly excited for a long period of time. Um, because LVA is using voice analysis and it is taking into account the, the noises level, etc., so it would um, often take different amounts of your voice in, or, or the subject voice into analysis, depending on the noise level. And the higher the noise level, the less um, voice data will come in. The less voice data comes in, we need a higher emotion intensity to identify the change. Again, this is something to remember all the time when you talk about um, voice analysis. And of course, when using LVA, when using any type of uh, lie detection technique, we must always remember there can always be something that we are not familiar with. There are always a Z factor. We deal with humans. <coughs> they have motivations which are not necessarily clear to us. They have some complex feelings which are not necessarily clear to us. And yet we try to come with a decision. LVA lets you screen through this. It lets you clarify the situation. It lets you ask questions that are not planned in order to clarify and understand the entire background and actually go really deep into your suspect's uh, minds. So, it's again very important to remember that LVA, like any other process, cannot be a science of fixed values or hard definitions. It's always a science that is based on statistics and probabilities and flexible borders. And as with statistics, the more elements you can control in that equation, the better the statistical outcome would be. With all that in mind, LVA is another tool in your toolbox. If you use it wisely, it will give you a wealth of information 
and will expand your capabilities during investigation and will speed up dramatically your understanding, your deep understanding of the structure of every case. Not in any case you care about it, but in some cases, that's the only way to solve them. And you really need to understand more about your suspect mentalities. This is the tool to do so. So, yes, LVA can detect the lies, and yes, it can detect the various types of lies, but that's a question to you guys. I mean, what is more important for you to identify the lie or to find the path or the, the easiest path or the quickest path to get the hard evidence? And that's a discussion that I would love to have. And if we have time, I don't know if we have time, I would really like to have your questions, guys. Okay. 